Good morning, everyone. I, I was going to say that not only it takes many, many months to understand what's going on, but it, it really takes many, many people from different specialty to actually understand what's going on. And uh, I'll, I'll start with a case that's really the product of a, of a team effort uh, from, um, from both the, uh, the Proud Clinic and uh, Dr. Gomez-Lobo is here, who's directing the, the clinic, uh, uh, with, uh, which is really a, a multidisciplinary clinic, urology, then Casella, uh, endocrinology, um, Kim Shimi. Um, and in this case, we also had a lot of help from uh, Judith Alumis from the Fetal Medicine Institute. So, uh, um, and then uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the case really encapsulates all the, uh, um, all the issues that, uh, uh, that are thrown at us as early as, uh, as in the prenatal period. Um, so the, the, the case, and I, and I would not dare show any images because <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to seem a little ridiculous by not recognizing anything. Um, <clears throat> so um, th this, uh, th this case had a, a cell-free DNA of uh, uh, 46XX, uh, and there was a concern by prenatal ultrasound for ambiguous genitalia, um, which, as you can see, a, a tulip-like appearance um, and uh, with possibly suggesting clitoromegaly. Uh, the uterus, as usual, and I think that's a theme that both prenatally and postnatally is very difficult to determine. Um, you know, from a non-radiologist, it, it's a little hard to understand, but um, it's, it's, it's interesting that it's, uh, it's so difficult. When you see any uh, hint of virilization in a 46XX, the number one by, by and large and statistically uh, should be CH or congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that. But it was a dichorionic diamniotic pregnancy and the other twin passed away at two months into the pregnancy. Um, there was, so at the newborn period, uh, there was virilization at prior to three. Um, there was a clitoromegaly and there was a near complete fusion of the labial folds and a single genital orifice. Um, so what, uh, what we do in the clinic is uh, measure the inner genital ratio. Um, and it, it's a good measure that gives you an indication of how virilized genitals are. Uh, and anything above 0.5 uh, uh, gives a, a, a hint that there is, uh, there is virilization of the genitals um, in an otherwise 46XX uh, um, carrier type. Um, so the first indication that showed us that maybe CH was not the, uh, the right diagnosis was the 17 hydroxyprogesterone, which is the hallmark of CH was not elevated. Uh, the testosterone was high. The karyotype uh, confirmed um, the 46XX. And um, there was a fluorescent insight to hybridization results for SOI that was negative. Um, so there was a diagnosis, uh, di diagnostic uncertainty. And I'll come back to what to do in these cases uh, in, in, in a minute. Um, so that's postnatally the pelvic and inguinal ultrasound. Uh, that showed uh, actual normal appearing testis bilaterally. Uh, adjacent epididymis, uh, um, but high in the inguinal region, and no ovaries or, or uterus were identified. So suddenly we're way far away from a diagnosis of congenital adrenal hyperplasia where you're expecting to uh, uh, certainly not see testis, you're supposed to see ovaries, and if you can see it, you'll see, you'll see a uterus. Um, so baby was seen uh, at Children's at the, uh, the PROUD clinic. PROUD stands for Positive Reevaluation of Your Genital Differences. Ooh, got it right. <laughs> um, and, and as I mentioned, uh, our, our leader is uh, Dr. Veronica Gomez-Lobo. Uh, and um, so 
the, it, it, it was a very interesting interaction with uh, with the family, uh, where um, first of all, initially the parents wanted to raise the baby as a girl, and the the, the main reason that they uh, uh, they stated was the karyotype and the lack of uh, SHOI gene. So they actually seem to understand the genetics, but uh, and that's, that shows you how uh, influential the prenatal visit is um, in, in shaping the, uh, the, the, the mind of the family. Um, now, I'll, I'll digress for a minute to say that, uh, uh, I, I know I'm recorded, but I'll say it anyways, that uh, there are new guidelines from the uh, Health and Human Services uh, um, um, department, if you will, the, the government, uh, that uh, is trying to redefine what sex is. And uh, it's become very, the, the proposed guidelines are extraordinarily simplistic, saying that it should be the genitals. And if you can't tell by the genital what's, what the gender is, um, in cases of ambiguous genitalia, for example, then the one and only parameter should be the karyotype. And, um, this is a great example here because it shows you, as you will see, that by going, going with this definition uh, will actually result in, <laughs> would actually result in really flawed outcomes. Um, because there's, there are many ways to define, to define sex and certainly not one um, parameter should, should take over. So that, that would, um, that, that would bring us back uh, uh, several decades ago if suddenly just a karyotype was to define, um, was to define the sex. Um, and as a second byline, I was going to say that uh, I, I spend a lot of time discussing this in uh, international meetings about uh, sports, and the sports authorities have defined sex for athletes with a karyotype for many, many decades, and uh, that resulted in, in the exclusion of a lot of women who had, for example, complete androgen sensitivity syndrome, so very, uh, very unfair situation. So in this particular case, um, on, uh, on, on exam uh, at the first uh, proud clinic visit, uh, the virilization of the genitalia was, again, uh, uh, apparent. Uh, clitoromegaly, near complete fusion, uh, with uh, a clitoris measuring 1.5 centimeters in length, 0.7 centimeters in diameters. Uh, gonads were bilaterally descended with the right one in high scrotal position. No hyperpigmentation. Um, so the plan was to obtain further genetic testing and follow up in a couple of months. Um, so, and, and I'm, and I'm Passing. I mean, those, those, all these slides were were uh, not prepared by me. Were prepared by the uh, uh, the, the proud team. So, I, uh, but I've, I've focused on the on the genetics one. Um, what was really interesting is that the uh, uh, so a, a gene panel was sent, and uh, <clears throat> it showed a pathogenic heterozygous variant in NR5A1. So NR5A1 is better known as SF1. Uh, or steroidogenic factor one. Uh, it's a, an orphan nuclear, nuclear receptor that's important in the functioning of the entire hypothalamic um, pituitary gonadal axis. Um, what's, uh, what's, and this, was, this is a very peculiar mutation, arginine to tryptophan in position 92. Now, what's, what's interesting about, about this is that in all the cases except this one, all the mutations that are known in NR5A1, uh, they are known to feminize XY individuals. Um, this particular mutation um, was shown, there was a, a paper a, a year before, um, including one of our patients from UCLA, so it was, a, it was a, an international effort with people from England and people from France, uh, showing that this particular mutation actually makes, um, uh, gives SF1 sort of more uh, 
masculinizing power and, and in a constitutive manner. And uh, uh, the reason why it was deemed as pathogenic uh, it was because it was this exact variant was published previously in cases just like this of XX individuals uh, with the presence of, uh, of testis, uh, therefore meeting the criteria of uh, XX uh, testicular uh, difference of sex development, formerly known as XX males. Um, so, and this mutation is known to be associated with variable degrees of testis development, so there is some, there's a spectrum of phenotype as very often in, in, in genetics. And um, so, and, and there, there has been a, a number of in vitro studies explaining the mechanism of this particular mutation. So it's a very uh, interesting and, and unusual uh, mutation. Mm -hmm. So the initial publication was four individuals, if I recall, and uh, um, the, the, the very first case that was brought to my attention was at an undiagnosed disease network meeting, and it was a case from Baylor, and it was a 19-year-old African-American. Um, and also the ethnicities is, are totally, completely varied. So, but some were, some were younger, but it, male, he was all, he male all the time, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, uh, we were, so interesting, this, this case and all these questions raise the question of, you know, what to do with, uh, what to do with gender and gender rearing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so <laughs> I, th th there's certainly no it, n no clear positive predictive value, if you will. Um, what, what, what I would say, for which what I would say, the evidence shows that increased levels of, of testosterone has been associated with a more uh, uh, typically masculine gender role behavior. Um, so, for example, if you take uh, individuals with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, that's where it's been the best shown. So it's a similar situation, right? The fetal adrenals will, will um, in a sense, bathe the entire body, including the brain, in high levels of testosterone. You're going to see, and, and they're very often, not always, but very often raised as girls, but they will display more stereotypically masculine types of behavior, and it's been shown for toy preference uh, in very controlled settings. Um, and you could say it's all, it's it's all you know society driven, except that on, in controlled settings, so you, you could say it's all brought about by the parents, which is possible. But they also later on in in life, they'll they're more tendency to to uh, to have more stereotypically masculine type of uh, hobbies or type of um, activities uh, or um, um, jobs, if you will. Uh, also, there is about 25 to 30 percent increase of uh, non-heterosexual sexual orientation in these girls, meaning bisexual, homosexual, etc. So, yes, in terms of gender role behavior, which I was careful to sort of carve out, Gender identity is a whole different set of um, complexity, and this is much less predictable. Um, and, and it's completely obfuscating by the fact that initially the gender of rearing of girls with CH is female, and 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 that plays an immense role in uh, in seeing what's what's going to in, in sort of influencing gender identity development. Now, about 5% of them will end up with gender dysphoria in large series, in congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Right. So, the, right. So, what you what another level of complexity, which is less the case here, but in general, is what exactly is happening in the brain. And you have a very, of course, indirect way of measuring because you're just measuring circulating testosterone. You don't know the local sensitivity uh, in the brain. Also, um, so so for all the cases of partial androgen insensitivity syndrome, for example, you're going to end up in not knowing exactly what was the sensitivity to testosterone in the brain. Um, in rodent model, models, um, what's masculinizing locally in the brain is in fact estradiol. So it's the local aromatization of testosterone in situ in the brain that actually masculinizing, masculinizes the brain. It does not seem to be the case in, um, in, in humans um, because uh, individuals with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome actually are typically behaving and identifying as females. Um, so even though there is local aromatization, it doesn't seem to, to masculinize. So it's, um, it's also hard to model. Anyway, I mean, there, so your question is a good question, but I don't really know how to answer it. Uh, so um, now, oh yeah. Um, so basically, um, well, I don't. Basically, initially, the, the parents were convinced that they, they wanted to go with a female gender of rearing, but after accumulation of, uh, of uh, additional facts, which was that there were testes, and then uh, even though there was no SRY and the, and the uh, patient was XX, um, they eventually, at six months, embraced the recommendation to pursue a male gender of rearing. Uh, and uh, the transition to dressing the patient in boy clothing using a male name, uh, and they elected to proceed with stage hypospadias repair that was performed. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, as as a as a male or as a female, uh, probably not. Neither direction. The the the, the reason is as as a female is because there is no ovaries. And the reason is, as a male, is despite the fact that there are testes, uh, there is no long arm of the Y chromosome that contains a lot of uh, spermatogenic regions. So, um, you know, so the answer is no. Uh, would it work with uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection? Will there be germ cells to, to extract? Yes, theoretically. I mean, you know, I, I don't think there is any example of successful ICSI in cases like that, to my knowledge. So, uh, so the, the the parents and I and I and I passed a number of slides. Of the, it, it was a, a, a rather uh, uh, religious family, very uh, deeply involved in, in 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 beliefs and what what sh you know the kind of sense of fate of what 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 should happen to them. So, they initially embraced the female gender and then they embraced fully the male gender and went all the way to really push for a stage hypospadias repair, which did happen. Um, so I'll pass on that. So basically, the diagnosis was 46XX testicular disorder of, of sex development. So that's the official name. There, was, there has been a lot of uh, changes and, uh, in nomenclature following the consensus conference in 2006, which <clears throat> ended up <clears throat> being very controversial because of the word disorder. So now we, we, we're trying to uh, say disorder slash difference or sometimes just difference of sex development. But <clears throat> in addition to, uh, apart from this particular controversy, there was an attempt to um, remove any gendered name in the diagnosis in, in order to avoid uh, influencing the parents. So it used to be XX male, but there could be cases of XX male that are, uh, there is just a, a, a little bit of uh, a testicular tissue and it will end up being, being a female and the reverse would be, would, could also happen. So if you name, if in the name of the diagnosis there is male or female, uh, it certainly plays a role in influencing the parents. So the goal was to avoid this. Um, so as you can see, this particular condition is rather rare. Uh, and to answer your question, I forgot there was this. <laughs> they all are infertile because of the absence of uh, azeospermic factors on the long arm of the Y chromosome. Um, most of these cases are SRY positive um, in 
I, that this these are works from my graduate studies, and we looked at I looked at large series, and it's about 90% at the time. Maybe now those numbers would have changed if we were doing a large series, but um, and 10% are SRY negative. Um, and those are for the testicular ones. Now, if you take the, and I believe really it's a spectrum, if you take 46XX over testicular disorder of sex development, it's going to be kind of a reverse pattern with 90% that are SRY negative and 10% that are SRY positive. Of course. Yeah, you know that's a great question, and I and I and I don't think uh, there is there sh there should be. That? I do it. Well, I think I, where is gender neutral? Right. So so the 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 argument against gender neutral is that society is not neutral when it comes to gender. So in, in many advocates, uh, sometimes very forceful advocates um, against genital surgery, have still advocated for gender assignment at birth. So. So there is, with, with the idea, and that's I think an important point, is that it's possible to, um, to, to, to have um, genital differences and yet be raised in a particular gender. In other words, what, you know, the, 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 the genitals should not necessarily match the gender. Those, so sort of separating the concept. And um, so, so it's, there are only a handful of um, uh, of advocates who will who will um, who will say that there should be no gender uh, assigned at birth. In fact, there there are, there are a few you know experiments that are well publicized by by parents, and they you know they're usually not at all uh, with uh, they don't have a kid with a, with a DSD, so it's just sort of like. A, hey, we're going to we're going to raise our child in a gender neutral way, and what happens invariably is that uh, eventually uh, it's it's not gender neutral you know it's just <laughs> the, the you know there, there is something to say about about uh, about yeah micro environment and about and about biology you know so um so so i'll i'll come to gender in a in a in a minute um yeah i'll, I'll yeah you know i and i wasn't there before but it's you know i, I i'm always thinking of uh, of determining Sort of a, a, a fetal a future gender, I should have said sex actually, by looking at either fetal, fetal testes or not, fetal uterus and fetal rectal vesicle interspace. And I, you know, I, 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 I'd like to learn more from 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 all of you about that. In in which one of these parameters you actually consider is the most important? Um, you distinguish yeah. between sex and gender. Yeah. So this is actually this is a, a terrible title. It should have been sex. So I. Uh, Apologies, uh, but but well, just because gender is really about identity, and it's uh, so there is no such thing as fetal gender, but it's just become such in a um, habit. People, you know, people do gender testing, but it's it's really sex testing. It's you know, um, and I I found this uh, this recent paper. Uh, well, it, it was actually an abstract from Society of Pediatric Urology, which I found interesting. Uh, looking at prenatal diagnosis in DSD, um, when they, and, and that's not genetic, but that's sort of like the outcomes of the prenatal diagnosis gives an idea of, of what is diagnosed and what is not diagnosed. And um, that was an end of 55, and half are uh, prenatal diagnosis of hypospadias, uh, either posterior or midline, and 16% anterior. So it's really uh, two thirds that are hypospadias, and the rest are. Uh, what's diagnosed for the rest is really uh, uh, is really rare. So um, I, I I thought that was uh, that that would be of interest to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're urologist. Yeah. yeah. That's a, yeah, exactly. That's 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 the bias here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, I I totally agree. <laughs> but it, it, that's why it's impossible to have to have like really an, an unbiased series. You know, they always correct. That's what it is. <laughs> no, that's correct. That's correct. That's what. It, yes, but but there was a there was a prenatal diagnosis of ADSD. 
Okay, and that's what it turned out to be, you know. Okay, so I, what, what I want to do in the, in the next, I don't know, is it 15 minutes that I have more or something like that? Less? But if you keep wondering, it's going to get less. Yeah. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, you, you know, one could say, okay, you you could you could do all the imaging you want, but and and ask all sorts of questions, but maybe if we were to do very early whole genome sequencing on everyone, maybe we would have better answers. And the answer is probably just as uncertain as it is with imaging. In which I think really the real answer is really a combination of, 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 of all approaches uh, together. Because certainly, as, as you will see, the genetic uh, side does not give uh, uh, a, a full picture of what the diagnosis will be. Uh, these are sort of numbers uh, of, uh, um, and we've talked a little bit about those, um, what is diagnosed. Um, Currently, or at the very beginning of this uh, of this particular study, uh, I mentioned 46 x extracellular DSD, 90% are SRY positive, 10% no known genetic etiology, and for overtest is sort of the reverse here. Um, for XY cases and cases of gonadal degenesis, uh, about 15% consistently will have mutations, point mutations, sometimes deletions, but it's mostly point mutations in the DNA binding domain of SRY. 15% mutations in SF1, which is encoded by the NR5A1 genes, that was the, uh, uh, what was in the case report. And then very rare genetic causes, uh, less than one, so they're just case reports, uh, mutations in SOX9, DAX1, and, and other genes, but the majority of known on genetic etiology. And it's really important to have a diagnosis for, for DSD from the patient and the family's perspective, whether it's prenatally or postnatally, and I, I really, I guess the point is that I was making in the beginning is that there is just no difference in the angst of the family of what's going on. So it's, it's and it goes through birth as if uh, <laughs> birth was a non-event. It just continues to, they just continue to ask um, what is going on. So it's, it's really, it, in addition to being an aid to monitoring, there is a true cathartic effect bringing to the family a finality of the diagnosis and less uncertainty moving forward. And so really what has um, changed our way of thinking in terms of diagnosis genetically is that it's actually affordable and more and faster to, uh, to, to, to get um, uh, sequencing um, because the speed is increasing, the, the cost is going down. This is famous NIH, uh, and uh, now it continues. It's, it's, I, I was like... Uh, um, Last week, I was uh, at a presentation in I was showing where it was, and it was like around. Uh, it's it's still it's it still hasn't gone below a thousand dollars, but it's very very close. It's uh, it's uh, uh, so you can see the the disruption. There there's kind of two disruptive events: the uh, in 2007 next generation sequencing that just makes it drop. And then in 2015, there's a second drop here, which is the uh, Illumina uh, X10, those like uh, really very, very large uh, clusters of, of uh, next generation sequencers that together bring the, uh, the throughput such, at such a uh, high level that the cost actually goes down. So it takes, so the turnaround time is, you know, it, you know, you could do it in less than 24 hours. There are people who do that. Uh, you would have to, you know, you have to stop all the press and just do it. But uh, in, in a research lab, you can do it in less than a week. Uh, in a clinical lab, you know, the turnaround time will be four to six weeks just for a whole sort of variety of other reasons of, um, uh, you know, Right. Yeah. So, and then there is the analysis. So, you, you know, if you're just doing one case and you have 10 people doing it, you can do it in 24 hours, which, which has been published. And in some NICU cases, of course, you know, sometimes it's just really important to get the diagnosis really fast. But it's possible, which is which is a which which is important. Um, and the cost in a research lab for whole 
exome sequencing, which is just the 1.5% uh, coding region, is about $600. And the whole genome sequencing is going to be about eh, $1,500, depending on how deep the sequencing is, et cetera, et cetera. In a clinical lab, it's, you know, the usual craziness of prices that are meaningless. So people quote $5,000, $10,000, um, you know. So um, the types of, uh, of variants that you can get from the genetic testing um, is, is sort of four different, uh, five different types. There's likely benign and benign that are common variants that are typically never reported. There are pathogenic variants that where the mutation has been either previously reported as causative, so like in the case that I showed you, the mutation in R NR5A1, in a case where the phenotype was a good match and the exact same variant was reported, it was pathogenic. Occasionally, the mutation is not, has not been reported before, but is deemed pathogenic if it's very likely to be damaging, so if it's frame shift mutation or splice site mutation. Could be likely pathogenic, no, a known gene that's known to be involved in sex development, but it's a novel mutation. So by definition, it's likely pathogenic because it's never been reported before. Uh, if it's a missense, you can never know for absolutely certain. And then there is this whole sort of uh, gray zone of VUS, a variant of uncertain or unknown clinical significance, with the big <laughs> question of whether to report them or not. It's even, even more uh, anxiety-inducing in prenatal situations because you will find variants of unknown significance in prenatal diagnosis, and uh, and you're faced with a, a phenotype that's certainly not certain in the in the prenatal period. Uh, so, uh, um, and the philosophy in in many places like here, like you know, is is that those should be reported when they're either cl when they're clinically relevant, but they're when they're actionable. Actionable could mean a lot of things. Typically, it would mean can we do additional, maybe functional testing, which we can uh, help uh, seeing if a particular variant is actually, uh, um, a ver if we can bump it up uh, to likely pathogenic or bump it down to likely benign. So this was a, a cohort of 40 patients, 46 XY, uh, and uh, uh, if you look at these, uh, we did find by uh, whole exome sequencing a pathogenic variant in 25% of the cases and likely pathogenic variant in 10% of the cases. Because we're a research lab, we did find VUSs that we believe, with some good arguments, we think uh, that they're convincing variants, but they, could, they would not be reported as likely pathogenic or pathogenic in a clinical lab. Um, the reason why we believe in 15% of the cases. So we think if we're conservative, we have a genetic diagnosis in 35% of the cases. Uh, uh, and if we're a little bit more optimistic, 50%, which, is, which would be pretty good. And it's consistent with other, uh, well, that, that's our paper, Baxter et al., but um, the other paper uh, in 2016 by an Australian team was, was also consistent with those numbers. Um, to give you a, a sense, these were two patients, uh, completely different presentations. One. Both XY, one ambiguous genitalia at birth, um, a, a familial case of, in a SIPSHIP of 14 with three other cases, and at uh, exploratory laparoscopy, one testis on one side and one ovotestis with fallopian tubes on the other. So by definition, a case of ovotesticular DSD. Patient two, much more classic presentation of a complete gonadal degenesis, a patient presenting with primary amenorrhea at age 15. Why do I put them together? Because whole exome sequencing revealed that they both had the same mutation in the sex determining gene MAP3K1 with the exact same variant reported previously in a family of five XY females with complete gonadal degenesis. Because the exact same variant was reported before, the variant called is pathogenic. However, none had been described before to have ovotestis or ambiguous genitalia, so what we did here is expand the phenotypic spectrum because of the, uh, the use of next generation sequencing. In this cohort, we found two more variants in this particular gene, MAP3K1, not previously reported, uh, that you are listed here. In first case, again, a complete gonadal degenesis. Second case, ambiguous genitalia. Here, the variant call is likely pathogenic because those variants 
even though very likely, as the name indicates, pathogenic, we can't absolutely prove that they are pathogenic. The next case with exact same variant will be deemed pathogenic. That's sort of how the literature evolves. So you would see in re reports addended and evolving, which is a good thing. It's not that the lab makes a mistake. It's the lab. The, uh, so I always encourage, and I, I know, you know, uh, geneticists here encourage to have reanalysis of the uh, um, of the genetic test, which is it's a great thing to do. One of the problems is insurance companies do not, it's not that they don't believe in reanalysis, but the test is done, and it's done for life. It's not going to change. The analysis will change, but they, won't, they will reimburse a test, not an analysis. So it's a, it's a real problem. Right. Wait at least about five years before. Right. So, yeah, there was a, there was a, a paper from Baylor showing that uh, they had a reanalysis after one to two years, and they increased their yield by between five and ten percent. It was, you know, kind of interesting. This is another example: uh, newborn with penis coral hypospadias, CORD, micropenis, but both tests were descended. Two variants were found: one in BNC2 a gene associated with hypospadias, not reported previously, uh, and another one in uh, FGF receptor. Uh, one, a gene associated with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, not reported pre previously. So you see there were also predictions. First one predicted to be damaging, the second one predicted to be tolerated. You know, uh, geneticists have a tendency to less and less believe in, in those predictions because they're different algorithms. They're not always uh, congruent with each other. Um, I personally believe more in, in numbers, and has it been reported before in hundreds of thousands of cases? Uh, but it has to be ethnically uh, representative, which is often a problem. So if it's the right ethnicity and there is enough cases and it's never been reported, I would put a lot of value in it. Here, the variant call is variant of uncertain significance because we just don't know what to do. Is it actionable? Well, for the second one, it is. You could, in this patient, actually test whether there is indeed some a subclinical level of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. You could test that. You could do a stimulation test. So that's the kind of thing. You could also, from a research basis, actually look at animal models. So this is an animal model we've developed for years in my, in my lab, uh, which is a model of an XY mouse that's under virilized. And it's a complicated association of, uh, it's a background of black six, which is a, a musculus type of mouse, and a Y chromosome of a domesticus type of mouse, which is called pus or poscavinus from, a little village in, uh, in uh, Italian-speaking Switzerland uh, called Poschiavo. Um, in any event, if you have these two things combined, you will end up ha never having an XY uh, mouse developing normal testes. Half of them will have two ovaries, and the other half will have over testes. Just uh, you know, so you and th those are uh, uh, fetal uh, images of the uh, of the uh, um, of mice. I just stood in the in front of an audience of fetal people, which are fetal mice. Uh, and you can see over testis, uh, like below there, B6Y pass on the left over testis, you can see the complete heterogeneous uh, 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 gonad with on the left the ovarian part and on the right the, uh, the, the testis part. So what you can do is then you can say, hey, are there differences in gene expression between the wild type, the testis, and the under virilized one, over testis or ovary? And, you can, uh, and you, you can look at it, that's the beauty of having an animal model, at the right, at the appropriate time. And you're going to have a list of genes that are differentially expressed between your control and your under-virilized model. And you can then superimpose that with your list of variants of uncertain significance obtained in humans by exome sequencing in X, Y, D, S, D. And uh, so you, you compare those two lists and you end up with, um, with, uh, with a list of genes that are both differentially expressed in a mouse model and have a VUS in humans. Then you can go further and ask, are any of these candidate genes under the regulation of SOX9, for example? And uh, we have animal models of uh, knockout of SOX9 where we can ask the question. Some of them are actually uh, down-regulated in SOX9 knockout. Um, I'll finish um, with, uh, you know, there are a few questions, always questions about this. What do we do about gender assignment? They're really, you know, it, this is a, a very oversimplistic view, but it just shows to you the, the, the sort of two extreme of, uh, of mode of thinking. Uh, 
uh, about this. The very traditional way I would say what determines gender is the gender of rearing, and the role of the genitalia is absolutely essential. You need the genitalia to, uh, to conform to the gender of rearing to, to help with the development of gender identity. So, and the challenging view is to say, and the other extreme, that gender identity is determined by biology, by prenatal androgens, and the role of the genitalia is not important at all in the development of gender, and it's a pure reflection of brain masculinization. So how do you assign gender? Look at the literature. You consider hormones, fertility, genetics. Should you consider external genitalia? Remains, remains a, 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 a great question. And I, you know, I usually take the example of CH, where the gender has been assigned typically always as female, mostly based on this notion that fertility should be preserved at all costs. Even if there is, you know, ex extreme, you know, com extreme masculinization, uh, prior to five, uh, there are inside uterus and ovaries, and fertility should be preserved. Um, these are data that sort of maybe challenge this a little bit, uh, showing that for CH with severe masculinization, when they're reared as girls, 5% experience gender dysphoria. Apologies for the for the typo here. Interestingly, not related to, degree, to the degree of genital virilization. So 5% is not that much, but it's much more than gender dysphoria in the general population. Um, if, you, if you have a rearing, a gender of rearing of CH as boys, it's very rare. The series are tiny. Uh, there are um, two series, one an N of 35, but uh, which were basically, which is often the case, they're initially assigned males because people don't know but then they realize it's CAH, but then in some few cases they're not reassigned females after the diagnosis. In this particular series, only 18 out of the 35s were adults and four out of 18 had gender dysphoria. So not that great of a, of a result. But there was a second series where 10 out of 10 were re reared as boys and no gender dysphoria. So really the jury is still out. It's not a good situation either way. Uh, Another uncertainty that's linked to it is whether or not to perform genital surgery. Again, the same traditional view would say, well, the anatomy must match the gender of rearing to reinforce gender identity and allow sexual intercourse in the chosen gender. And the decision maker has to be the physician and the family because the decision has to be made really early. The challenging view, of course, is that the genital surgery is performed to comfort others with possible negative consequences harder to change gender if one has been assigned, and there are, there is growing evidence that, that uh, uh, there, there may be, in a number of cases, some influence of negative influence on sexual function. The decision maker, for, in the challenging view, has to be the patient when old enough, which we don't know when that is, but it's when old enough. Uh, <laughs> so how do you perform genital surgery? Based on literature, very little available, at least prospectively. Uh, plus the surgical techniques do change, which is not a bad thing, but it makes the study of, uh, of outcomes very difficult if you change the, the surgical techniques uh, often. So there is really no evidence-based answers, and often it becomes an ethical question. In the case of CH, if you perform surgery, um, there are now in the literature evidence for multiple uh, complications uh, from vaginal stenosis, hairy vagina, short vagina, so it's not, um, it, it's, it's not uh, uh, that of a rosy picture. And uh, it, I know in the, in the Proud team, we're, we're, we discuss those complications with the families. Interestingly, many of them still choose the, uh, to, to, to go ahead with, uh, with the surgery. So it's a, you know, it's a very uh, difficult situation. The, the other way would be, well, easy, let's just rear them as boys because there is little to no surgery needed and, of course, no loss of sensitive genital tissue. Now, rearing a, a, an individual with CH as a boy has more long-term consequences and complications, which is there are still uh, ovaries inside. And at puberty, these ovaries, will I mean, these ovaries will go through puberty and the uterus will menstruate. So at some point, something, and, and it will, you know, so it's, it's again, a complicated situation. Uh, you could suppress puberty, of course, but you can't suppress it forever. So something must happen at some point because you can't rear a boy that eventually will menstruate. 
I mean, I, I don't think that's a reasonable option. Uh, the final uncertainty is about disclosure, which I think on this we've made uh, a lot of progress with the traditional view to limit disclosure to a maximum to pre prevent gender identity confusion, and the challenge of you to do full disclosure to prevent secrecy and shame, which I think most, m most clinic and big centers uh, do provide full disclosure. Uh, so I will stop here. We're part of a, a large uh, um, NIH-funded uh, network called the DSD Translational Research Network. And um, thank you.